So tonight, I don't know if we're going to be able to get through two sessions, but tonight we want to talk about, it says single parent households, um, and I think solo parent households is a, is a better language, but be that as it may, <clears throat> we know that from the very beginning of God's creation designed for families, that he intended for two parents to be involved. Now remember, he ordained the family to be one man, one woman, married to each other, and in unity on the most intimate levels. And then to carry that on into how they dealt with the, any children who were born into the family or brought into the family through adoption or other ways. Yeah. More and more and more though, we see families not fitting the pattern of God's original design. We also know that whenever God's original design is abandoned, ignored, denied, or rejected, the inevitable result is going to be pain and destruction. And the longer it continues, the worse it gets. Now, as counselors, very often we're going to sit across from people who've taken on their circumstances, their experiences as their identity. It's no longer a matter of what, what has happened. It's, this is now who they are. So when you understand the dynamics of, 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 single, of single parenting, and you're able to speak into the lives of these single parents, that's one of the most important aspects of family counseling that we can encounter because you don't have two parents cooperating together. You don't have two parents in the same household maintaining God's original design. Remember, God's original design and created intent was for us to be in safe, caring, loving, nurturing relationship first with our biological parents who are gonna be lovingly married to each other for their entire lives. Well, if that it breaks down, then the, the devastation that that brings, the disintegration of family and the after effects of that on a child's life are, are lifelong. So <clears throat> key verses, um, we are his masterpiece created anew in Christ Jesus. So the good prepared long ago would be our way of life. That's my translation of Ephesians 2.10. For those of you who've done Unbound, you, also, you know that. Um, whom do I have in heaven but you? I desire no one but you in all the earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God always protects my heart and gives me stability and strength. That's my rendering of Psalm 73, verses 25 to 26. And then, of course, we're, we... We see with Peter, I can pray this because his divine power has bestowed on us everything necessary for life and godliness through the rich knowledge of the one who has called us by his own glory and excellence. So how we view ourselves is immensely important. It carries more weight than anything else because if we don't view ourselves the way God does, then we are going to see ourselves inaccurately because we're believing lies. And remember that believing lies is the foundation of all devastation. It's not the foundation of life and liberty in Christ. So for a lot of people, their identity is usually found in their societal position or through what they're involved in rather than who God has proclaimed them to be. And this is just as common within Christian circles as it is outside of Christian circles. Remember that Jesus defines us by our relationship to him, not our social position. So the I am statements, we talk about this often, the I am statements are the most important statements that we can make. So if you're a husband, a wife, a parent, a teacher, a coach, housewife, doctor, whatever, the ontological statement that precedes this label, the I am this. And now in the context of what we're talking about in single parent households, Often a single parent will say, I am a single parent. And it can serve as a, as a, as a, a way for people to, to categorize them, to maybe understand them and their circumstances a little, a little better. It is a poor way of, of them defining themselves. 
what this comes from is prior to this, they defined themselves as married or as a married parent. Okay. And again, this can help people um, understand the circumstances, but it's not a good way for them to define themselves. So let's talk about why this matters so much, especially when we're dealing with, with solo parenting. There are two kinds of married people. Those whose marriage enhances their life and those whose marriage defiles their life. Okay. Or defines their life. So if a marriage, if marriage defined a person, then their spouse's death or divorce robs them of their identity and has desiccated their life, just destroyed it. Okay. Well, there's two kinds of parents. If one's parenting as a single parent now or a married parent before enhances their life, then the joys and heartaches of parenting are handled from a position of strength. But if that person has allowed themselves to be defined as a married or now as a, as a as not married parent, then life's meaning has been lost and all the challenges of parent, parenting are approached from a position of pre-defeat. I'm not married, so I'm less than. I'm, I can't be as effective as, as uh, of a parent. Now granted, God's original design and creative intent is for be two parents working together, a father and a mother. But if the circumstances are such that that's not possible, does that mean that child can't be parented well? It can be very difficult and it's not God's ideal, but that doesn't mean that this parent is, is not up for the task. Okay, so what our goal needs to be is to help people who are trapped in this way of thinking to allow the gospel to redefine them from God's perspective. So when we're looking at from the from the, the perspective of parenting single, there's a lot open and available now. There's a lot of a lot that can be hoped for, because what that means is Jesus is now the most significant other. And again, we see that in Psalm 73 far more so than any former spouse they have, have had or any wished for spouse they've desired. We see in scripture how God is a judge for the widow and a father to the fatherless. God's the partner now. God is the partner now. That's something you can pour into these folk, people's lives easily and often. So we know that the typical single parent is a mother. About 84% of custodial parents are mothers. 15% of custodial parents are fathers. Those numbers are starting to switch a little bit. Um, in some jurisdictions, fathers are, are granted um, a custodial care um, more and more. Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, they're usually divorced or separated. So 55% are currently divorced or separated. 34.2% have never been married. That's a high percentage. 19% are remarried. We talked about this before. And 1.7% are widowed. Um, we look at the employment stats. At any one time, about two thirds of single mothers are also working outside the home a slightly greater share than the share of married mothers who are also working outside of their home. Only two fifths of single mothers are employed full time the entire year and a quarter are jobless the entire year. So we have a poverty factor that's being added to this. Now, if a single mother is able to work, her earning power still lags significantly compared with men's about 78 cents to a dollar for the same job. And the wage disparities are even greater for women of color. African American women, 62 cents, Hispanic, 55 cents, and Latinas, 53%. 90% of custodial single fathers are gainfully employed. 71.7% work full time year round, and 18.4% work part time or part year. So the numbers are, are incredibly different between men and women, fathers and mothers. Mother and children may live in poverty. Half of single mothers and families have an annual income less than 20,000. 
Median income for single mother families is $20,353. And that's less than one third of the median for married couple families. Only one third of single mothers receive any child support. And the average amount these mothers receive is only about $300 a month, in spite of what the court has ordered. Okay. That's why in some jurisdictions, they actually have a, um, uh, a depart, uh, uh, an office within the district attorney's office that prosecutes, criminally prosecutes, parents who are not taking care of the child support as they're supposed to. Single mothers are more likely to be poor than married couples. Poverty rate for single mother families in 2011 was 40.9%, nearly five times more than the rate for married couples, 8.8%. Poverty rates were about one in two for Black. Hispanic was 49.1%, white 33%, Asian 26.3%. And among all other ethnic groups, Native American female headed house, households the children have the highest poverty rate, 53.8%. Nearly one in five children, some 16.1 million, were poor with 47.6% of them now living in single mother families, and that which is up uh, a full percentage point from the year before. And these are old stats, so I apologize for that. Talk about hardship, um, two fifths of single mother families are food insecure. When we're talking about food insecure, we're talking about um, there's a lot of top ramen. There's a lot of uh, mothers won't eat and the children will eat whatever food might be available. The subsidies, food pantries, those types of things. And they have to scavenge. They're not able just to go out and buy food. Um, they only get so much in food stamps. And if they're not getting supplemented with child support or anything for the children, those food stamps only go so far. And the thing is, they're not gonna buy nutritional food. They're gonna buy cheap food that's gonna go a long way. There's a lot, so you not have not just the poverty factor. So we're talking about food insecure. We're not just talking about um, how much food, we're talking about the quality of food that uh, is available. And the thing is, is that sometimes they have to decide, um, um, are we going to eat or are we gonna have a roof over our head? What a horrible dilemma to be placed in. Uh, two fifths of all single mothers receive food stamps. Uh, children with single mother, mothers, 41% get food stamps, 59% don't. Um, and there's all kinds of different reasons for that. Um, although two fifths of all single mothers are poor, only one tenth of all single mothers receive TANF, where temporary assistance for needy families. And though a small percentage, they represent more than 90% of all TANF families. The problem with the TANF program it has been so gutted that those who even qualify for TANF are getting less than a third of what they used to. So this is worse than poverty. This is worse than poverty. Go ahead, Yanko. It's kind of sad too, because um, I worked with women who are on TANF and if they got a certain amount in income, they would lose it. And, yeah. and basically it wouldn't be worth moving up in positions or anything like that. So they get stuck at this, um, at a certain pay rate because they don't wanna lose that chunk of money. It's, yeah. really, it's a really sad situation. Yeah. It's almost like it, it's, it's forcing them into being underemployed and underfed. And it can create so much stress and anxiety. And this is why we're gonna talk about the role of the church here in a minute. Um, so let's access to healthcare across all income le levels. Single parents are the group who are least likely to have life insurance. And that's according to a, a study of financial company and university of, and the University of Virginia. And what does that matter? Well, if you have one parent bringing an income in for the family and mom can, something happens to mom, how are those children gonna be cared for? When they're, if they don't have family that can take them on, and a lot of these, these, these children, or these single parents are in families that have broad spectrum poverty already. So 
we can't take on two more mouths to feed. We can't take on four more mouths to feed, okay? Life insurance would be a financial base for these children to be able to, to survive on going forward. Mom can't afford, mom can't afford life insurance. Um, and this study also showed that single parents with children living at home, again, the majority headed by women, comprise the highest percentage of uninsured Americans compared to married parents. Uh, Childcare affordability, again, I've seen so many single moms. It costs more for them to pay for childcare than they can make. So what it doesn't, they can't afford to work, but yet there's benefits they can't get if they're not working. So now they're in this horrible dilemma, right? Um, education, single mothers often spend over half their income on housing and the third on childcare. And that leaves them less money for educational expenses. The thing is, is that many times if they could, they could take some classes, if they could take some kind of a certification thing, they would be able to increase their income potential, but they don't have the time or the money or the energy. So now they're trapped again. Um, you look at, yeah, we can look at peer companies. So usually, raise, and single mothers are usually raising one child. So 54% of custodial mothers are raising one child with the absent, from the absent parent. And 46% have two or more children living with them. Um, but what's really interesting is that um, um, the more children there are generally, the less involved the other parent is. So the dynamics of parenting, single parenting are greatly increased because you have multiple children you're trying to do this without a parenting. You're not able to co-parent well with someone else. So this was largely limited to poor women and minorities, but single motherhood is now becoming the new norm. And the prevalence is due in part to the growing trend of children born outside of marriage coupled with the increase in marriages ending for any number of reasons. So you have more and more marriages disintegrating. So you end up with single parenting going on. In 2012, four out of 10 children were born to unwed mothers and nearly two thirds are born to mothers under the age of 30. Now we know that every st story is different, but when you examine the figures, actual single parent statistics may surprise you. According to custodial mothers and fathers in the child support released by the US Census Bureau, there are approximately 13.7 million single parents in the United States. And those parents are responsible for raising 21.8 million children, approximately 26% of the children under 21 years old today. Vast majority of individuals raising children alone started out in committed relationships and never expected to be single parents. Remember, Less than 2% of these are people are single parents because of widowhood, being widowed. Warren, I was gonna share something. Going through the adoption program right now, they were saying that the fastest matched, the fastest matches are for single, single mothers looking to adopt. So you have that aspect and then you also have single women wanting to reaching a certain age and realizing, Ooh, my time is, you know, getting close. So I'm going to go have a baby through IVF and, a, and donor sperm. So I, I wonder how much that plays in probably not as high, obviously, but a piece of people seeking yeah. to be. Uh, and again, you have, you have more and more women who are deciding to have children without being married for a right. variety of reasons, variety yeah. of dynamics. The thing is, is that statistics show how important a two-parent household is all across thousands of studies. And to say, oh, well, you know, a, a, a single woman wanting to adopt is going to be able to adopt a child quicker doesn't make sense statistically. That has to do with, with emotional with feelings, fairness, and relationship. It has to do with a postmodern worldview and not what's in the best interest of the child. It's actually what's in the best interest of the adopting parent. It was something like two weeks. They get like the average weight. It kind of blew my mind. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the agencies that are doing that are going to have a real hard accounting to get from them. Um, 
Uh, anyway, um, parenting is challenging under the best conditions with one parent. The challenges are multiplied, not doubled, but exponentially increased. You coping with child child rearing for single parents becomes more difficult because number one, responsibility overload. When one parent makes all the decisions and provides all the family needs, you, you responsibility overload. You got task overload when the demands for work, housework, parenting can be overwhelming for one person. And then you have emotional overload. The single parent must always be available to meet both their own and their children's emotional needs. There's no break, right? Now, sometimes you have extended families that are living together and you'll have grandparents and those that are helping, but more and more and more, you're actually seeing grandparents end up raising their grandchildren because you've got a single mom who gets into a place where she can't handle the stresses and strain. She's now turning to drugs and alcohol and those kinds of things. Just to try to get through life, the children end up forsaken, abandoned, she never intended that, but she's so she's so overwhelmed. She doesn't cannot doesn't know what else to do. And we've had many many women through our residential programs in exactly that state. So alone or in combination, these result in problems for the single parent. Add to that loneliness, anxiety, shame, depression, and life can quickly become overwhelming. Uh, support from friends and relatives can offset the effects of overload, with friends offering a buffer against loneliness and relatives giving more practical help. One of the difficulties most often heard in counseling is that the single parent is not asking for help from family and friends, including church families, because they sense that they are overloading others with their problems. I don't want to be a nuisance. I don't want to be a burden. There's also the poor job most churches do with ministering to the needs of single parent households which further adds to the sense of abandonment and hopelessness. One of the ministries we did at a church that I pastored several years ago was we partnered solo parent households with three other dual parent households and youth. And we tried to bring in uh, people from the senior adult ministry. So we really tried to surround them with a family from the family of God. But we would partner them with three, we tried to partner with them with three families that had co-parenting going on within the household. Why? Because there were other children involved, right? Um, the dynamics of family were something that, these, that the, the, the children in this single parent household needed to experience. And it, gave the gave the single mother an opportunity to experiencing to be exposed to co-parenting and learn some things and actually talk through to somebody else of facing these challenges because they don't have another partner and by having the partner with two or three other families you kind of spread the load and you spread and you end up with this community around this small family which is really how the body we believe the body of christ is supposed to work the very few single parents can successfully raise children alone, um, despite the expectations of the church and society that non-custodial parents, usually the father, should only be responsible for supplemental financial support, while the custodial parent, usually the mother, takes on both parenting and the economic roles. And what are the effects on children? Those, uh, um, these children will fall into two categories. Um, those attributed to lower socio economic status of single parents and the short-term consequences of disintegrated family diminish over time, okay? So five factors that predict a child's adjustment to the divorce of their parents. So we talk about the resiliency factors. One is the passage of time. Second, the quality of the children's relationship with the residential parent, the level of support from the non-residential parent, the level of conflict between the parents and then the economic standing of the children's residential family. Now, remember when we were talking about blended families, this is where we see some of those dynamics of the, the, of the step family and the, the you know, or two step families um, being very, very important. Now, the first few years, few years after the divorce, children have higher rates of antisocial behavior, aggression, anxiety, problems in school, um, 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 just 
not being not being themselves, if you will. Uh, the stronger the support system, the more these negatives are mitigated, of course. When we have children from a single parent household account for 72% of teenage murderers, 60% of people who commit rape crimes, and 11 times more likely to exhibit violent behavior. These, this is from a single parent ha household. And this is, isn't because the parent, the single parent's doing a bad job. This is because the effects of the disintegrated family on these children and the lack of support they have outside of that single parent household. In mother only families, children tend to experience both long and short term economic and emotional relational difficulties. Higher absentee rates at school, lower levels of education, higher dropout rates with boys more negatively affected than girls, and more delinquent activity, including alcohol and drug addiction. Um, when you see single parent households in, in some uh, socioeconomic areas, this is why gangs are so powerful because it's a place where they where they feel like they can they can belong, and that becomes a substitute for the family that becomes their family. Adolescents, on the other hand, are more negatively affected by parental discord prior to divorce than by living in single parent families, and actually gain a responsibility as a result of altered family routines, usually after at least some short term negative behaviors resulting from the emotional turmoil of the disintegration of the family. And of course, as, as children from single parent families become adults, they're more likely to marry early, have children early, and divorce. And girls are at a greater risk of becoming single mothers as a result of non-marital childbearing or divorce, okay? So important information to understand and all these dynamics going on. Um, and the children are the ones that are bear gonna be bearing the, the, the bulk of the negatives of this, not all of it, but the bulk of it, because the children have no say in this. They didn't create this mess. They're not the cause of this mess. But here they are. They're bearing the results of what happened between the parents. And I can't tell you how many children I've counseled who believe that they were the reason their parents got divorced. There was, the, if they had just been better, if they kept their room cleaner, if they hadn't fought with their sibling or some nonsense, if I'd done better in school, they really believe that some way, somehow they are responsible because the parent that left didn't just abandon the parent that they're with, they abandoned them too. What is it about me that made me so abandonable? And of course, as they get older, they start to realize that it wasn't their fault. But the younger the child is when this happens, the more devastating it can be long term. Um, so let's talk about single parents in the church. <laughs> oh, this is one where I really got to pray to be. This is so hard. Many single parents have negative views of the church. Some are based on actual experience and some are based in spoken and unspoken messages that cause them to feel stigmatized and marginalized. So what are some of these messages? The single parent families are subnormal and dysfunctional by definition. Parents who are single by virtue of divorce are second-class Christians and unworthy of or disqualified from important church roles, right? Well, there's a stigma that goes with you being a single parent. Uh, church is the happy family place. Families in crisis disrupt the peace and harmony of the church. And another message is church is a couple's world where singles, singles are relationally defective and abnormal. Think about the kinds of questions that are asked of single people, whether they have children or not. So what are your, what are your plans for marriage? What the assumption is that everybody is supposed to be married. Now scripture tells us other than that. Scripture tells us that there are people who are intended by God and prepared by God to be single for their entire adult life. But you're, we're married, you need to be married just because you're supposed to be like us. Because if you're not like us, there's something wrong with you. 
So in their daily efforts to give their best to their children, many single parents simply will not take them to churches where they risk being taught that their family life and parents are substandard and inferior to everyone else. And if that is every church they ever go to, they just don't go to church. And faulty perceptions work in the other direction as well. Many people in church see single parents as too needy and ministering to them is posing a financial burden upon the congregation. And this is the, there's the perception that kids from single parent homes are problem kids and disruptive. Well, sure, they may be a little bit because life is disintegrated and they don't know how to process it. There's also the perception that single parents are emotionally desperate and therefore sexually promiscuous. Now, one of the things that we dealt with often when we were in the Pacific Northwest was women from solo parenting homes. There was one church in particular that has mul multiple locations now, and it's a franchise up there. And they had a they have a have a fund set aside to help single parent families. You have this woman who's getting no child support from her former spouse and has four children that she's homeschooling. She can't afford to go work because it costs more for her to work than it does for her to stay home. She's doing everything she can to make ends meet. She's taking in an ironing. She's, she's doing all kinds of those types of things. Around about July, the church told her that she had accessed as much of their fund set aside for helping single, single parents as um, they were going to be able to provide her. And you know why? Because the rest of that fund was for women who weren't members in the church. That money was set aside for people outside the church. So outreach was more important than inreach. So we're going to abandon the one another, the commands to one another. We're going to abandon the commands to focus on the brethren first, and we're going to we're going to focus outside the church first. Well, I don't know about you, but I have all kinds of problems with that. But the message that this woman got and her children was, was they were too needy. They didn't create these circumstances, but they were getting a lot of shitting. Well, this should be different. You should be that. Well, you shouldn't be homeschooling. You should put that based on what? You base that on what? On what standard do you base that? This woman prayed about this. And she saw what was happening to the behavior of her children being in the public school. It was horrifying. When you have a nine-year-old girl who suddenly, suddenly is dressing as if she's 23 years old and be starting to behave in very sensuous ways, oh, no, 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 no. Pulling that girl out of the public school and bringing her home was the best thing she could have done for her. But the church didn't look at any of that. And th not this is just one case of many that we dealt with. But this is common in churches. So on top of all this, there are the recurring questions about not condoning divorce. There is a fearfulness of some whose marriages may be susceptible to outside temptation. And there are some who voice concerns about the church, about the use of church resources. And still others grow concerned about the image of their fellowship of grieving needy wind, widows are drawn to the place. Right? We're not gonna get the upper crest. We're not gonna get the people who really don't need to be here. Two parent families have problem kids, financial difficulties and moral issues as well. Single parent families just seem, seem to create a greater risk for the healthy ones. Not true, but it just seems that way. What are the long-term effects? With the right support system and guidance for dealing biblically with the disintegration of the family, most can find the healing necessary to adjust and recover and not experience ongoing problems. So, um, okay, let's talk about key factors in counseling and then we'll take our break. Single parents prefer to interact with couples in order to avoid being singled out as different. So they need to be integrated into the general Bible study and family ministry structure of the church 
but also need regular time when they can get together, get together as a mutual support group. Um, one, of the, one of the worst things that can happen is a, is a Sunday school class for young marrieds. How about a, a, a Sunday school class for young parents, married or not? See the stigmatizing that goes on right there? Uh, children from single parent families, especially teenagers, do not like being separated out of the special groups while their peers are meeting. They, they want to, they feel like, uh, they like feeling part of normal church and youth groups. They don't want to feel like they need to be quarantined or separated out because there's something wrong with them. They don't want to try any attention drawn to that dis disrupted part of their life. We have to remember too, the single parents are extremely busy between work, playing with their kids, school, housework, grocery shopping, house and car maintenance, church activities, child events like sports and music, illnesses and a zillion unforeseen emergencies, they get worn out. They need very practical help with parenting because half of the parenting team is missing. Single parent families almost universally live on shoestring budgets. A child care is expensive and consumes a lot of a single parent's income if they have much of an income. And single parents are survivors who learn how to manage their families. Help them learn to trust the wisdom God has given them and to consult him regularly and often. They need to be discipled. How do we tap into what God has been teaching you? How do we help you draw from the strengths he's given you through all of this? Sometimes it would be nice to have a little break from kids and to interact with adults. And single parents with no family support to lean on are usually the most open to being ministered to. There's a lot here that we've covered. So what I want to do is we'll take our break. We'll come back. We'll kind of do a, what are your thoughts on what we just covered? And we'll cover the end of it. Okay. So let's finish this part out. So let's talk about the counseling goals. The place we always start is help them discover or rediscover their identity in Christ. We need to teach them how to live vibrantly as a Christian, as a child of God. And for the time being, in God's providence, that happens to be not married and to have one or more children. Remember, single parenthood is their situation, not their identity. I'm a mom who's single. I'm a, a parent of a daughter. I'm a parent of a son. I don't happen to be married yet right now. Who they are is God's son or God's daughter. And they're united deeply and forever with Jesus Christ. Common chords connect them to both Jesus and his church body. Regeneration, the Holy Spirit's infilling and presence, the God-breathed scriptures, fully adequate to address every challenge, sins forgiven now and forever, the call to one another ministry, God is Father, faith, hope, and love. They live right in the center of God's redemptive work and are as important to his unfolding plan for this world as any other person, married or not. Second thing is we need to help them resolve issues that contributed to them becoming a single parent. So how did that singleness happen? How are they dealing with the divine providence that brought them to this place at this time in their life? Were they widowed, divorced, abandoned, cohabit, uh, cohabitors, not married, who no longer who, who no who, who no longer cohabit? Whenever any of these partner relationship ends, it is deeply painful and causes grief. So, along with helping them handle the new challenges of single parenting, they also need us to help them work through their grief. Remember, we were never intended but God to experience loss especially loss of relationship. So this grieving and bereavement process is painful enough, even in the best of marriages. And if their prior relationship with their lost spouse or cohabitating non-spouse was unhealthy, in other words, if they built their life on the other person as an idol, or if distance, guilt, bitterness, or unresolved conflict characterized the union, in other words, it was oppressive, it was abusive, it was ungodly, 
then the grieving process can become complicated, prolonged, and even stunted because they're not grieving something that was healthy, but it's still a loss, so they still grieve it. Perhaps they and their spouse are separated or were divorced. So along with the sadness of loss itself, with the similar grief dynamics to the death of a spouse, they have the added broken pieces of a shattered relationship and the present complications of dealing with a former spouse. Again, divorce, when divorce takes place, a death has occurred. The problem is there's no corpse to bury. The corpse is laying on the dining room table and never goes away. You're always dealing with that thing. Maybe there's strife over child custody, shared parenting, visitation, or financial support, or maybe decisions concerning the child's welfare, um, not agreeing about the child's schooling or health concerns or any of that. Uh, what about the privileges of the in-laws, the, the, the grandparents, and on and on and on. So who is the primary custodial parent? That becomes a factor. So does the degree of involvement the ex wants to have in the children's lives. And one of the things we find often is that when you have the disintegration of a narcissistic relationship, the only reason that narcissistic the narcissist wants access to the child is to have access to control mentally, emotionally, and mentally and emotionally control the other the other person, because their narcissistic supply is trying to escape. And if I can't affect them directly, I will affect them di in indirectly. And one of the worst ways we see that, that manifest is what we call um, vicarious uh, Munchausen's, where the non-custodial narcissist parent will convince the child that there's something wrong with them and they have to have medical attention, medication, all kinds of stuff, especially when it comes to mental health issues. And it's all for the purpose of controlling, emotionally controlling the other parent and dealing with this with two cases right now. It's horrible. Can you say that name again? Vicarious. Munchausen's. Munchausen's is where a person will get sick and they'll claim all kinds of illnesses and stuff like that where they need ongoing medical you know, crisis, or they'll do it for their child, right? They'll do it with the vicarious, they'll do it. The, the child needs this medical attention because now I do. There was a movie not long ago where this gal was injecting her daughter with a, um, a, a um, um, it, was, it was actually used in the veterinary medicine. And she basically made her, made her daughter lame and they had all these things that were going on and everything else. And the girl ended up discovering that what was going on. But again, it's like vicarious Munchausen's. Um, anyway, then you add dating desires, remarriage prospects to the situation. The compounding pressures can confound even the strongest single parent. On the other hand, maybe they were never married. Maybe they were, they were raped or seduced. Uh, perhaps they willingly engage in premarital sex that never led to marriage. The discovery of the pregnancy was a shock and a surprise, leaving them faced with a monumental decision. She decided to keep the child, to boldly bypass family members, friends, and inner voices that urged abortion. Maybe she considered entrusting the baby to qualified, loving, adoptive parents or to a trustworthy agency that would help in that. But in the end, she opted for single motherhood. Whatever the causes and conditions that got them there, God speaks to their situation clearly and succinctly and addressing all the issues that relate to it, whether guilt, shame, remorse, regret, trashed emotions, bad memories, anger, bitterness, resentment, loss, grief, fear, or whatever the struggle may be. God speaks to these things. The third thing, of course, is teach them to saturate on and cling to God's promises. As with any healing work, Scripture saturation is going to be a key part of the process. Exchanging faulty or damaged faith and beliefs for the truth is foundational to being able to live the lives God has created us to live. The overarching hope for the single parent is the fatherhood of God. God the Father has a special place in his heart for the widows and the fatherless. 
three passages to have in your toolkit for them is Psalm 68, verses 5 and 6, Psalm 146, verse 9, and Isaiah 54, verse 5. It is God who first who comforts and cares for the emotional and spiritual needs of widows and widowers and the fatherless. Again, Isaiah 49, 13 through 15, and Isaiah 66, 13. And one of the ways God cares for the single parent is through his admonitions for his people to protect and care for widows and the fatherless. So this is not, this is not optional. This is a mandate. We see it all through scripture. And without knowing and holding on to the personal presence and involvement of God, single parents can quickly feel as if they're parenting alone. Yet it's important that they understand God's love for their children is even greater than their own. And it's interesting as you all well, know God loves them more than I do. And then they'll say, but, and then they focus on what they're feeling. They're not able to say, even though I'm feeling this, I know God loves my children more than I ever could. Remember, we talk about turning the butt around. Butts and eraser work. If we say, I know God loves the, my children more than I ever could, but whatever comes next is what they're focusing on. And it's going to be a negative. But if they declare the negative, this is what I'm thinking, this is what I'm feeling, this is what I'm experiencing, but God, but God, two of the four most important words in scripture, but God loves them more than I do, ever could. See the shift in focus? Critical part of what we're going to help them do. It's not denying the circumstances. It's not letting the circumstances define everything. Um, when children become part of a single parent household, they're affected just as deeply as a parent is. They need to be discipled to love, trust, and obey God in spite of the circumstances, even more so sometimes. Uh, a broken home is no excuse for unbelief, rebellion, ingratitude, or idolatry. So it's about not idolizing the negative circumstances and not taking those things on as their identity. But they also need to be taught how to go to God with the deepest, most troubling ideas and emotions that they experience. We're back to uh, Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. They are people creating the image of God and have the same hope in God that everyone else has. Now, this may be especially important when the non-residential parent negatively influences the child. We see this a lot. The non-offending parent will need to teach the child to pray for themselves in the same way the caring parent does, that God would use every means of grace to save, protect, and strengthen the child. So we'll talk about this a little bit more. <clears throat> You'll have a non-custodial parent, non-residential parent who um, won't even be attentive. The kid is, the, the child is there and they park them with, with, the, child, with the child, with the, the grandparents or with a, with a sitter or um, maybe there are older children in the home. They'll have the older stepchildren or step, step siblings care for them and not really interact with the child. So, or they let the child do whatever, they don't really care. And whatever discipline is going on in the, the residential home, it's not followed up on, it's not reinforced. And so you have all, all kinds of negative things going on. Um, so again, negative influence. So it's a matter of teaching the child, yes, you and I both know that's not God's ideal. That's not the way God wants us to live. So we need, to, we need to pray about this. And when you're not here, you need to pray for you. You need to pray for your dad or you need to pray for your mom or whoever. Um, the next, we need to encourage them to continue as fully as their circumstances will allow to be actively involved in the minute worship and ministry of their local church. The one and others are there for the benefit of all believers. And it is important for the single parent to try to not disrupt the family's involvement with their local fellowship more than necessary. Now, while changing churches is sometimes necessary for a variety of reasons, this is not generally the case. The demands of raising children alone can require sacrifices of time and energy once devoted to church ministry and activities. That's kind of a given. While that may well become the case, staying connected and involved is a critical part of the care nurture and discipling that God intends for all of us to experience as part of the body of Christ, no matter our status. Um, one of the things that has been very disheartening 
and aggravating is the churches that have uh, home groups or grace groups or whatever you happen to call them, right? Um, they, the demographic that they, that they cater to is not going to be across sta status like it needs to be, right? What do you do with a single mom with the two teenagers? Well, we don't have a group for them to fit in. Okay, why not? What, what is it about them that they won't fit? Nobody else has teenagers? I find that hard to believe. Oh, nobody else is a single parent. I find that hard to believe. Well, the other people in the group are married and have small. Okay. Where are the one another's? Where is the not showing preferential treatment? Where is the not being prejudiced? If you're a leader of a church and you're co-signing this and enabling this, you are not functioning as a faithful under shepherd to the great shepherd. You actually, as far as I'm concerned, have disqualified yourself from the role. And I'd have no problem saying that to people's faces, and because I, I have. Um, have them recruit mature men and women of God to serve as models for the family. And sometimes this can be really difficult. I know uh, a single mom recently who went through a just a drag it out four year battle trying to escape from a narcissist. And there's a Christian family that lived across the street. There were other Christian families that were, were around. She could not get these Christian men, these Christian fathers to invest in her little boy. Well, I really don't have time for that. I only need to invest in my own kids. You do. But what about this orphan? What about this child who does not have a godly father around? Don't you also have a, an obligation to them before God? My question, of course, or are you, are you even really a Christian? Have you read this book? Right? That might seem like I'm guilting them, but okay, I'll guilt you. I have no problem doing that. If you're not walking obediently to the word of God, I am going to call you on this because you're adding to the oppression that this family is experiencing. You don't get to do that. You don't get to do that just because it's not convenient. There may be other legitimate factors, but just because it's inconvenient doesn't wash. As you can tell, I get my dander up about this. Um, next is help them guard their heart from getting improperly involved with anyone romantically. I can't even tell you how important this is because one of the very first things that happens after the disintegration of a, of a marriage relationship is start wondering about the next one. No, you, you, you have to count on a couple of years of grieving. You have to count on a couple of years of grieving and healing before you, you're at a place to even be prepared for something like that. And especially with younger children, your child is counting on God's economy working itself out that my mother and my father are supposed to be lovingly married to each other for the rest of their lives, okay? And if they're not married to each other, for either one of them to marry someone else means that there's no way for God's intent to ever be restored, okay? And a day may come when that child is healed and gotten solid to the point where they don't need that parent the way they have. I, I went through that. I was suddenly a single dad. I have a young son. I got to care for all by myself. Okay. No dating, none of that. Why? Because he needed to know. He needed to know that he was my priority no matter what. A day came when it became apparent to both of us that he needed a godly man, a mom person around. There were things there were things, influences he needed in his life. There were things needed to be spoken in his, to his life that needed a, a, a godly woman to do, that loved and cared for him, not just somebody who was part of the church. And of course, there were no women in our family who could fill that role. So um, he and I both realized that this, so we started saying, Lord, what, we don't know what to do with this. And then, of course, 
God provided an answer to that prayer that we didn't even realize, right? Some of you have mentored. So while it does fall within the teaching of scripture for those who are once married to be remarried, there are limits to this. So five key questions need to be asked and answered. Number one, are they free before God and others to marry or remarry? Two, do they desire to get married, remarried for the right reasons? Is it just to be married or because God is compelling it? Third is, is this match God's best? Are they well suited for each other? Um, I walking through a um, situation with a gal who, um, five kids, um, the three oldest kids are out of the home. Um, the fourth one is close to that. The youngest one is in middle school. Husband dies. Um, a few years later, about three years later, she meets someone who has three young children who is widowed without any counsel, without any guidance, without any anything, they end up married. Okay. Well, here we are nine years later, and it has been nothing but a train wreck from the very beginning. Okay, well, all the children are out of the home now. And it's still a train wreck. There's still all this garbage that's happened. All this poor parenting and poor, poor blending into the families and all, all kinds of stuff. And they were not suited for each other at all. They're absolutely not suited for each other. But they didn't seek counsel and nobody stepped in. And they said, oh, well, you know, you're both widowed. You're all, but of course God would want you to marry of course, why? Based on what? Has a proper foundation been laid spiritually, emotionally, and relationally for these two people to get married? And have the unique challenges of blended or stamp families been addressed and prepared for? And that remember, even adult children need to be considered because this is still blending the fam blending a family. Because you've got not just you don't have co-parenting now, you're going to have co-grandparenting going on. All right, so don't forget that factor. So conclu our concluding thoughts, a single parenthood does not spell doom for those whose faith and trust are in Jesus Christ first and foremost. The trials of this world can be faced full on when they want facing those trials to surrender their hopes, their fears, their doubts, and their dreams, their wants, and their needs to the sovereign creator and sustainer of all things. Single parenthood is as much a place of discipleship as any other status or circumstance any of us might find ourselves in. If one's core identity is rooted in being created in the image of God and being redeemed in Christ, the struggle may be long and difficult, but it will bear righteous fruit. On the other hand, when one's core identity is found in societal status and function, life and sense of self collapse and life implodes. The results are devastation and wretchedness. And in other words, you go from one misery to another. So as biblical counselors, our mission is to bring people to the place where they meet Jesus Christ in a deeply personal way, surrendering all they are and have to him. I do a lot of counseling of solo parents, um, disintegrated marriages, um, where the, the faithful one has been blindsided by the betrayal of the other spouse. They're devastated. They never got married with a plan of being not married, unmarried, no longer married, never in the plan, never, it's not on the, not on the menu at all, but here we are. Being married is not the point of your life. Being God's child is the point of your life. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ is the point of your life. And if he determines that you're to be remarried, he will make it clear. He, it will become a compelling thing from him, not from your own heart, your own desires. But it'll be compelled by him. And remember, strong desire does not equal need. He will supply for all of our needs legitimate needs sometimes our desires can be so strong they feel like a need that's why we have to continue to surrender those to god 
And that has to do with any kind of relationship. It can do, do be an adult child with lousy parents that you've still never been able to work out. Okay, so you're in your 40s and they're in their 60s or 70s. Okay, don't, don't pursue a healthy relationship with unhealthy people. Focus on the one another in relationships. And when you're talking, when, when I'm counseling a believer, the number one thing is do not get romantically involved with someone who's not truly a spiritual sibling. God forbids it. It's not just a recommendation. Don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. It says do not. It's command language. You walk down that road of disobedience. That is not a union God will bless. Maybe 40 years from now, it'll end up being that way. But if you walk in disobedience now, do you really anticipate God say, well, hey, no problem. I'm going to honor and bless this union. Not a chance, kid. Not a chance. And it's hard. It is hard. When, because... That one flesh sense that you've had and carried with you and, and everything that benefited that, when that's removed, when that's ripped away, you know what that's like. You, and the desire to replace that is very strong. But what is God's best right now? That's what we have to keep coming back to. What is God's best for me in this? Yes, these are my strong desires. Yes, I wish this was the case. Yes, this is what I want. Yes, this is what I'm hopeful for. But Lord, what is it? What is your best? What is it that you desire for me? Help me desire that too. And it's that case with anything, but especially when you're dealing with the single parenting, because it's such a gross violation of God's created order. We're supposed to parent together. We're supposed to be married for the rest of our lives. Those things are God's design. And the disintegration of that has, does significant damage to the heart, the soul, and the mind. We know that. And often it has physiological impact. Think about stress and anxiety and grieving and over that over the long term. It can have an, a huge emotional impact on a person's health or a huge impact also on a person's physical health. So anyway, let's talk about what your thoughts are and what we've covered this evening. I'm going to go ahead and stop this.